We're moving on to our next resolution. It deals with Russia. Yes, Russia makes trouble for the US, interfering in elections, meddling in the Middle East. But just how potentially dangerous is Moscow to the US, really? It has nukes, but an unimpressive economy. It has Putin, but a plethora of domestic problems. Might we be over-worrying the Russia factor, or are we not worried enough? Let's find out. Our resolution for this round, the Russia threat is overblown, making his first, making the opening statement in regard to this question, Stephen Cohen, on the resolution, the Russian threat is overblown. Do you declare yes or no? Yeah, and you could write a book about it, and in fact, I just have. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> let, me, let me just wrap it up, and I don't need 90 seconds. It's what they used to call a no-brainer. Putin's Russia represents absolutely no threat to the United States except those threats we ourselves have provoked, mainly through NATO ex expansion. Second, Putin himself, contrary to the newspapers, has not been mainly an aggressive leader, you would think that's his middle name, but a reactive leader. And that's the way he's seen mainly in Russia as well. Third. Russia today, like it or not, is again a very great world power, certainly militarily and diplomatically. Herein lies the tragedy, and on this I'll stop. Putin's Russia, anyone's Russia, should be America's number one national security partner in the world. Washington squandered that opportunity after 1991, and it's continued to squander it today by inventing or provoking threats residing in Russia which do not exist. Thank you, Stephen Cohen. <laughs> to speak next on the resolution, the Russia threat is overblown. Kori Shaki, do you declare yes or no? I agree that the Russia threat is overblown, but not uh, because the Russians pose no threat to us or desire to pose no threat to us. I think Russia is largely a threat to us through its weakness rather than through its strength um, and through its own choices rather than through our choices. Uh, the Russian government under Vladimir Putin defines its security as having its neighbors be insecure. Uh, the invasion of Ukraine, the invasion of Crimea, the invasion of Georgia, the frozen conflicts in Abkhazia and Nagorno-Karabakh, the military exercises that they are holding simulating nuclear weapons use in the Baltic states. Uh, what Russia as a state appears to want is other countries to fail, and that will make it feel safe. That's why I think Russia is a threat to us. Second, they're a threat to us because they are still a large nuclear weapons armed state and uh, the likelihood of miscalculation or war breaking out and escalating to nuclear use, I think we, we are not worried enough about that as a general problem in international relations. And the third reason uh, I think Russia is a threat to us is because they want to be seen that way, right? John McCain uh, always used to say that Russia wasn't, didn't have an economy, it was just a gas station. Um, and they actually don't have much an, of an economy outside of oil, uh, and yet they are intervening in Syria. Corey Ashaki, I have to cut you off. Thank you very much. Your time is up. <laughs> On the resolution, the Russia threat is overblown. Our next speaker, John Mearsheimer. John, do you declare yes or no? I vote yes. I think that the Russian threat is completely overblown. I think the Russophobia in this country is off the charts. It's almost hard to believe uh, how much Russophobia there is uh, in the United States. Now, I do think that the Russians are uh, a low-level threat in social media, but who really cares? Uh, the question is whether they're not they're a strategic threat to the United States, a military threat in Europe. And the answer there is almost certainly no. First of all, they don't have the capability to conquer any meaningful territory in Eastern Europe. Uh, the idea that this is the second coming of the Wehrmacht or the second coming of the Soviet Union 
uh, is a laughable argument. And not only do they not have the capability, they have no interest because they understand full well what happens when you try and conquer other countries. They occupied Eastern Europe for a long time and they were just glad to get out of town. They don't want to go back in there. You say, what about Ukraine? I agree completely with Steve, and I've written about this. The Ukraine crisis is a result of our making. It's a result of NATO expansion. It's a result of the fact that we tried to make Ukraine part of the West, and the Russians found that intolerable, which is completely understandable from their point of view. To the extent that they are a threat, it's because they have thousands of nuclear weapons, and that should scare the living bejesus out of all of us. But the fact that we're provoking them in Eastern Europe and in other places just makes it possible that those nuclear weapons will be used, and that's something we want to avoid at all costs. Thank you, John Mearsheimer. The Russia threat is overblown. Well, Mark Eric, do you declare yes or no? No. I mean, I, I have a bit of a split decision on this one. Uh, first, I mean, I think the threat is easily manageable, uh, if, if, particularly if we maintain NATO. Uh, I, I noticed that a few individuals up here probably don't want to maintain NATO, NATO and they're oddly the ones who believe that Russia isn't a threat. I think if NATO goes down, then Russia's uh, problems uh, loom large. I will just say this. I mean, if, if you have an individual, a dictator, who is sending uh, military intelligence agents out into small cities in Great Britain and letting loose nerve agents, that's a problem. Uh, if you have a Russian... If you have a Russian dictator that is uh, helping in the slaughter of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Syrians, that is a problem. And I, I, would, and I want to dwell on that just a little bit more. I mean, I, I think people tend to make light of what's going on in Syria. It is a, f a vast humanitarian tragedy. Uh, Vladimir Putin helped save Assad. And uh, he has unleashed there what he unleashed against the Chechens. Uh, and it is a very, very ugly engagement. And I think he is making a play for power. And I think it is worth, worthy to note that the Russians still only have uh, offensive strategies in the military. They're not concerned about a NATO uh, invasion. Now, on the other side, I agree with John. Uh, I think the whole notion of the Russian electoral interference in the United States is vastly overblown. I find it very boring. Ruel, thanks very much. Your time is up. Finally, to speak in an opening round on this resolution, the Russia threat is overblown. Derek Chalet, do you declare yes or no? No. Uh, and that's because Vladimir Putin's Russia has a clear set of strategic goals to divide the U.S. from Europe, to undermine NATO, to weaken the European Union, to project Russian power in the Middle East, to support liberal and nationalist politics, and to weaken the United States and our democratic partners around the world uh, undermining the very foundations of our democracies by spreading disinformation and fomenting dissent. Now, on some of these goals, Russia's succeeding. On others, it's not. But it would be strategic malpractice for us not to take this seriously and simply dismiss this threat as overblown. And although the U.S.-Russian relationship is not inevitably one of confrontation, and there have been recent examples where the two sides were able to come together and achieve common aims, we do need to be clear-eyed about the Russian threat. That said, I agree with some of my colleagues here. I do not believe that Russia is the greatest challenge to the United States in the 21st century. Russia is not 10 feet tall. Its economic and demographic woes are profound, and many of its actions around the world have boomeranged a back against it. But Russia's weakness doesn't diminish the threat. In many ways, Russia's weakness makes the threat worse, causing Moscow to take greater risks and seek new nefarious ways that it can achieve its aims. So we can't put our heads in the sand and dis dismiss, dismiss Russia's intentions as benign. We need to take this threat seriously. Thank you, Derek Chalet, and that concludes the opening statements on the resolution, the Russia threat is overblown. And let's look at the flags now. We have two no's and three yeses on the resolution, the Russia threat is overblown. And from what I hear, heard in the discussion, there were, there were basically two lines of arguments. One is that Russia is not really that powerful and capable, nor motivated to be truly threatening. Uh, actually, there are three lines. The second one is that the, uh, the aggravation between the Russians and us 
is at least partly our fault, that they are provoked by us. And the third line of argument is actually Russia's doing really, really bad stuff in the world. It's really dangerous, it's really corrosive, and it should be contained. It should not be, uh, it should not be allowed, they should not be allowed to get away with it. I wanna, I wanna take uh, this, this third question about whether Russia really stands 10 feet tall or not, as Derek Chile just put it, and I wanna put it to John Mearsheimer. The, the, I, what I wanna just throw into the mix here is the fact that right now, Russia is dallying with China. Uh, certainly to tweak us, uh, maneuvers in the Mediterranean together very recently and other contacts between them. China's certainly got to be taken seriously. Why not worry about Russia's playing dalliance with China as a threat to us? The fact is the United States foolishly pushed the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. The United States has a deep-seated interest in getting Russia to help the United States contain China in Asia. And the Russians are perfectly willing to do that because China is a greater threat to them to the United, than the United States is because of geographic proximity. But because of our foolish policies as a result of the Ukraine crisis, we've pushed the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. If these American policymakers today had been running foreign policy in the late 30s and early 40s, instead of allying with the Soviet Union to fight Nazi Germany, they would have had the Americans declare war against both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. That shows you what dunderheads they are. For, for the sake of nuance, I'd like to ask Corey Shockey, who is arguing the yes as well, but for very, very different reasons, what you make of John Mearsheimer's argument, that it's that the, the Russia's aggressive seeming posture is our fault. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't see a whole lot of evidence for that, to be honest, uh, because we have tried very, very hard, the United States government, to bring Russia into cooperation, to uh, include them in things, the NATO Russia Council, to create opportunities. I mean, Bill Clinton and Boris Yeltsin working together on all sorts of things. The problem is that that's actually not what the Russians want. What the Russians want is a confrontation with us that solidifies Putin's uh, sense of domestic control and that makes Russia feel powerful in the world when they cannot, by dint of a foreign policy that doesn't include the invasion of Ukraine or bombing hospitals in Syria, um, to feel powerful. They don't want to be powerful on Western terms they want to be powerful as an antagonist to us. Stephen Cohen, looking at the list of, 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 of aggressions that Corey just mentioned and that Ruel went into in more detail, let's talk about the slaughter in Syria. Let's talk about the campaign, whether you think it's successful or not to undermine uh, con Western uh, democracies' confidence in themselves as democracies. Mm -hmm. um, again, going back to the dalliance with China, how is this not whether you think we provoked it, we the U.S. provoked it or not, how is this not a threat at this point? Well, it depends on how you formulate it. I mean, for historical and political reasons, not entirely due to bad American policy, a unique alliance is emerging in the world today, Russia, China, Iran, and it's a new reality. Um, to call that a dalliance is kind of to disregard decades of history. Uh, China's moment in the sun is coming. Russia has to decide where it's going to be in this order. The old order is falling apart. New one is emerging. Whether we like it or not, we don't dismiss it as a kind of capricious, anti-American uh, move on Russia. It's driven by powerful factors. Uh, Crimea is usually given as Putin's original sin, the invasion of Crimea. The advantage, and I don't mean to be rude, that I have over people who wave this Russian aggression flag is, is I've actually studied Putin for almost 20 years, and I don't think you could find the word Crimea in any of his talks or interest or foreign policy priorities until the United States abetted the overthrow of the legitimately elected, whatever a rotter he might have been, president of Ukraine in February 2014. John wrote about this in Foreign Affairs back in 2014, I think, John. And then Putin had to make a choice. Crimea is what it is, vital to Russia. It was part of Ukraine accidentally territorially. Russia didn't care until what happened in Kiev. Well, I mean, so me there's a history to these provocations. A lot of the stuff that's been said here that Russia, I mean, please, let's don't do John McCain's uh, gas station. I mean, you know better than that. If you don't, 
Russia is either the seventh or eighth largest economy in the world today. The INF and the World Bank think that Russia is really doing well. They issued reports two days ago, despite the American sanctions. Uh, we can't get to space without okay. American rockets. Stephen, let me bring so in Roel. Let, let's don't go to this R nonsense about a gas station. Roel, the first, the first part of the, the first part of what of, of Stephen's argument that you know, talking about Crimea, that again we pushed. Putin into a position where he had to act. Whether you concede that or not, the fact is that Putin grabbed Crimea. Does that strengthen your argument, or do you find Stephen's argument persuasive that it's not that big, it's, it, it doesn't represent a threat to us? No, I don't find it persuasive. I mean, I, I do think there, I get to the issue of why, I mean, dictatorships hang together. There is a reason why China and Russia and Iran have made an alliance. They, uh, they run oppressive societies and they have the common denominator that they all really don't like the United States terribly much. Uh, so the, the notion that somehow the Americans are going to anesthetize their democratic identity or their democratic mission is just preposterous. We're not going to do it. They know we're not going to do it. And what is striking to me is when I listen to Putin, I mean, I understand why the supreme leader of Iran likes him. He sounds like him. It's the same type of lexicon that they use to describe their common enemy. So the, I, I think it's just misplaced to talk about this realist potential uh, of somehow we're going to build an alliance with the Russians. It's not going to happen because they don't want it to happen. If you were to actually have a thriving democratic society develop, I know that seems like a million miles off in Ukraine, it could kill Putin. I mean, they have to squash it, grind it into the dust. They have to have a, sub, uh, a subservient society in Ukraine because if they have an independent one, it's the most lethal dagger aimed at the political system that Putin has built up since, the, uh, since he came into power. Derek Chalet. Also D Derek, no let, let, what the no, go ahead, Ukrainians for want. Yeah, the, I mean, that's what, what's striking to me is, is how it becomes America's fault that the people of Central and Eastern Europe want the United States closer to them and want to be protected from Russia. I don't understand how that becomes America's fault. When we would sit in meetings with, with counterparts from the Baltics or the Poles, they would, they, would, they would talk about their great concerns about Russia and be thankful for everything the United States is doing, but then also go out of their, their way to remind us that the several thousand troops the U.S. may be rotating through the Baltics is just a small fraction of the Russian divisions that are lined up on their border. And after Ukraine, what they all thought is this could be coming to a theater near us soon. Because what Putin wants around his border are countries that essentially can exist under his thumb. And, and the Ukraine crisis did not start because of NATO. That, NATO was not about that at all. The people were, were in the Maidan, thousands of Ukrainians are in the Maidan because they wanted to be closer to Europe. They wanted to be closer to the European yes. Union. And that went against Putin's objective, which was to create his own sort of rival institution uh, closer to himself, the Ukrainian uh, undemocratic president wanted to go that way. Unfortunately, the people of Ukraine wanted to go a different way. John Mearsheimer. Yeah, I, I just want to say that the United States has the Monroe Doctrine. And the Monroe Doctrine says that no distant great power, i.e. a great power from Europe or East Asia is allowed to move military forces into the Western Hemisphere and form a military alliance with a country in our hemisphere. It makes eminently good sense for the United States. Russia, being a great power, has its own version of the Monroe Doctrine. The Russians recoil at the idea that NATO is going to march up to their border. They recoil at the idea that Ukraine and Georgia are going to be part of NATO. The Russians oppose NATO expansion vigorously from the mid-1990s uh, forward because they viewed it much the way we think about the Monroe Doctrine. And it was our moving of NATO up to the border and saying that Ukraine and Georgia would become part of NATO that led to the Georgia War in 2008 and led to the war over Ukraine in 2000. That's why the Ru thousands of Ukrainians let's, were in the Maidan in Kiev let's in 2014? Bring in, let's bring in Roel. Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, the K got to give the KGB some credit here. Uh, and their successor, the SVR. I mean, for God's sakes, they penetrated the entire Western security establishment. 
They are well aware that NATO has no offensive doctrine against Russia or the Soviet Union. They know it backwards and forwards. That's why they don't waste any time planning to have a defensive strategy with their units because we, they know we're not going anywhere. This pity the poor Russians, they're scared of big bag America, it just makes no sense. Corey Shockey, we heard earlier in this discussion the charge of Russophobia, that Russophobia is is out of is off the charts, and that this attitude that that uh, with, would be sympathetic to your argument is problematic in itself. What about that? Well, I think um, I agree that we are more worried about the Russians and building them into a bigger threat than they actually are. Uh, but that is a natural reaction to Russia's bad behavior. There's a reason, as Derek said, that people are worried about Russia because they poisoned two people in the streets of Great Britain. They, they're doing the kinds of things that are making countries More. feel incredibly anxious. More than two. Uh, Why is that a threat to the US security? Uh, because if they will do it in Britain, would they not do it here? Given the, what the Russians are doing, it looks to me, is they know, I agree with John, that the Russians couldn't win a conventional war in Europe. The Polish military, the German military, the French military are strong enough to, uh, to band together with our help and defend themselves against Russia. What the Russians are doing is fighting asymmetric strategies, picking away at areas of unprotected uh, Western dominance, social media, poisonings, the kinds of things that make them feel intimidating. And that's why there's this strong Russophobia building, because people rightly assess that Vladimir Putin's Russia is a malign actor in the world. And that concludes discussion of this resolution. The Russia threat is overblown.